I'm Dr. Randall Smith with Christian Travel Study Programs, and we've been exploring the lands of the Bible all over the Mediterranean world. Today, we're on the beautiful Celebrity Reflection. What a vessel this is. I've been traveling the region of the Mediterranean. Here I am by the Aegean Sea on the island of Mykonos in Greece. But I've been traveling for 35 years, trying to expose and show people the context of the biblical narrative. For these last couple of decades, we've been making these videos site by site, trying to expose who was Jesus? Who were the people that followed him? What happened as a result of the gospel message? And we are taking a look at the background of Paul's writings in places like Italy, in Malta, where he was bit by a snake, in Athens, in Corinth, and in some of the beautiful places like these islands that were all recipients of the early gospel message. Each one of our sites will be picked up in this series as we try to expose the background. And we're hoping that you will learn more and that the Bible will be more deeply meaningful you, to you. Even if you can't come on the tour, at least you can experience some of what we do as we make the journey together. Calimera. Welcome to Mykonos. I'm in the Aegean Sea as part of our cruise program with Christian Travel Study Programs. And we are taking a look at the background of Paul's writings to the first century world, 13 named epistles. We're spending six sessions together on board the Celebrity Reflection, looking specifically at the background of Paul and at some of the letters that he wrote. We spent some time in Romans looking carefully at the 16 chapters that he wrote to the very center of his world, to the Roman church. We we're looking at Philippians and Titus and Philemon, some of the writings of Paul that will help us to understand him, as well as spending an entire session just on the background of who is Paul? What do we know about him from archeology span and history today? We're glad you joined us for this little view of a window into what Paul wrote and why he wrote it and how it affected the known world. We're glad you joined us, and we hope that you'll spend some time in these six sessions learning just a little bit more about the Apostle Paul. I want to take a look for a few minutes at the book of Titus. It's shorter uh, than the earlier session. I want to take a moment and just hang all of what we've been learning together on who Paul is. So let's remind ourselves that he's born to Jewish parents. He's born in Tarsus, southern end of Turkey, southeastern Turkey today. And Tarsus has the third largest university in the Roman world. So he's a, born in a college town. And he's born just about, oh, eight, ten miles away from the sea. So they get fresh fish. They've got a river that goes in and out. As a, just like Ostia would carry things up to Rome, there was one like that in Tarsus. Born at about five in the common era, a younger contemporary of Jesus. Jesus was probably nine or ten years old when Paul was born. I wonder if he ever stopped and thought about, guess what happened today? Anyway, uh, he inherited Roman citizenship from his father, and that's a status that would prove very important to him later on, right up to the point of his death. Roman citizens are killed differently when they're executed than non-citizens. So Peter will be, in fact, crucified. Paul will be beheaded, which is the much preferred way if you have a choice. Let's just say neither of those are good choices, but one's a lot better than the other. Um, he always had the name Paul, Paulus, short stubby one, and Shaul, Saul, which is his Hebrew name. And at his circumcision, his name among the Jews will be called Shaul after the king. His name among the Gentiles will be called Paulus. 
And we know that he was incredibly zealous toward God in Acts 22, all the way up until he met Jesus. And honestly, at that point, the zeal had to be turned over to building the church that he had sought to destroy earlier in his life. He is first encounters Jesus on the road to Damascus, gets into Damascus, escapes from Damascus, gets into what's called Arabia, which I think is probably Jordan in the southern part that is all Arab at the time of, of Paul. And so he spends there several years learning from Jesus himself in the desert places and then makes his way through Jerusalem, stops <laughs> off in Jerusalem, according to Galatians 1, and then goes up to Tarsus and goes back to work. And he's making tents and binding cloth. And Barnabas comes in from Antioch and says, we've got a fledgling church growing in Antioch. We need your help. Come join us. And so he makes his way to the Antioch church. Sometime later, the Spirit of God will choose Barnabas and Saul, and he will tell them, separate for me Barnabas and Saul. I got a mission for them. And the very first mission journey of the church starts because God pushes a local church that's been praying and growing into moving into that ministry. There are three mission journeys. The first one is a journey somewhere between 45 and 47 in the common era. Uh, and then he'll go basically to Cyprus and into what we would call <laughs> Turkey. The second missionary journey is after the Jerusalem Council in 50, carrying letters initially to take those to the churches that they had reached in the first missionary journey, that is Gentile churches, and tell them they do not have to become Jews and fall under the temple and atonement system as long as they have Jesus as their full and complete justification, the temple will do them no good. And, they, and that they are to abstain from the pagan temples and from things that are blood or things that are offered to idols. And if they'll do those things, they can follow Jesus and they'll be just fine as Gentiles. Now, this fundamental division should help us because there are a lot of people that run around going and say there's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither bond nor free, neither male nor female. And they forget that that's always in regard to salvation, not in regard to lifestyle. Jews and Gentiles lived differently before the gospel, and they live differently now after the gospel. God told the Jewish people to keep the Sabbath day for all their generations forever, that that would make them a unique people on all the earth. He did not tell you you had to, because you're not Jewish and weren't at Sinai and didn't swear allegiance to that. Rather, you can worship daily, any day of the week, and house to house as the early church did, but expect your Jewish friends, even those who know Jesus, to continue to do things God gave to the, to the Jewish people for all their generations forever. Because if you erase their forever and substitute until Jesus comes, then you're erasing your forever until what? In other words, if you can modify the word of God, when God says do something forever, how long should you do it? forever. Don't resupply until Messiah comes with forever. Because when you start messing with the text, you've now undone the forevers. Well, wait a minute. Then there is Jew and Gentile. Yes, there's also bond and free. That's why we have two restrooms at our church. In other words, as it regards salvation, there's no difference between men and women. As it regards lifestyle, well, duh, there's a big difference between men and women. He's not saying that there's no distinction. There are things that men are commanded to do in Scripture that women are not. There are things that women are commanded to do in Scripture that men are not. I, as a man, am not to disciple younger women and teach them to love their husbands. Whose job is that? Older. Older women. Now, that just means longer in Christ. You don't have to feel old, okay? You can feel very young, but be older than her, right? The word actually is fresh women. It, when it says younger women, it means it says fresh women, like fresh fruit, you know? And the point is that they don't yet know what goes wrong. There are good reasons why the biblical writer commands me as a man not to do that. Because discipleship can also become lots of other things. So you keep that separate in your life. And there are plenty of times, can I tell you the number of times I've had dear people say to me, you got to sit that woman down and you got to tell her she's got to dress differently. And I said, no, ma'am, you need to. It's not because I'm lazy and it's not because I'm avoiding conflict, although I really am. It's because, it's because I'm commanded not to do that. 
And the women are commanded to do that. And if we would all do what we're supposed to be doing, we'd stop doing what we're not supposed to be doing because we'd be too busy doing what we're supposed to be doing. <laughs> now, he, got, he went on the second missionary journey to go back and tell them that they were not, in fact, needing to become under the atonement system. Atonement was temporary, and it had two very weak points. One, because I worked at raising the lamb, I got the idea that I co-worked in my redemption along with God. Because I raised the lamb and I brought the lamb in unspotted. So when God forgave my sin or abated his wrath and turned his face away, he did it with the notion that there was uh, some cooperation on my part. Or at least that's what they thought. And that was wrong. So in Jesus, you know, you didn't do anything because he did, came and did it for you. The second problem was atonement was temporary. You had to keep going and killing more lambs. So let's just say it this way. The death of Jesus and his resurrection was the best news that sheep have ever heard. Okay, from a lamb's perspective, this was a good day. Okay, that's what I'm saying. All right, now there's a third missionary journey, and this is after the death of Claudius at the rise of Nero during Nero's good years, 54 to 59 were his good years. This is during 54 to 58, and he goes back and covers a lot of territory, but he also spends a long time at Ephesus. And then eventually, after his three journeys, he makes his way to Jerusalem. He's arrested in Jerusalem for having taken a Gentile into the balustrade or the soreg, the 13 gates around the temple, where it says, uh, if you're not Jewish and you come past these gates, your blood's on your head. He was accused of having taken Gentiles into the temple. He didn't do it, but that's what he was accused of. And while he was under arrest, he was swept away from Jerusalem, taken to Caesarea, and he sat in Caesarea between 59 and 61. But he's arrested in Jerusalem, and he stays under arrest in Caesarea by the sea at Israel between 59 and 61. Sometime after two years in prison, he makes his way during the period after having seen Antoninus Felix and Portius Festus. He'll be then before Herod Agrippa II. We're now in the middle 20s of the book of Acts. And he will then be carted off by boat, by several boats, making his way over to Rome. It's at, uh, during that journey that he will have his uh, fourth shipwreck, which means he travels on the cheapest possible boats or the worst possible times. But Paul then has his fourth shipwreck He's at Malta, he comes up on the beach, he's gathering sticks, he gets bit by a snake, and everybody says, well, that's the end of him. He's obviously under arrest, he's avoiding prosecution, and now he's bit by a snake, and everybody waits to see him drop dead. When he doesn't die, they all go, wow, he must be telling the truth. And God uses a manifest miracle in order to point out that Paul is, in fact, the guy. Follow him. And he begins to preach in Malta. And then eventually they get another ship, the ship with the Dioscuri, and they make their way over to the direction that we're going now. We're heading into uh, the Naples Bay and the Naples Harbor. He'll get off in, in Putoli, which is near where we're, we are going to dock, and then make his way for a while. He stays in Putoli, and some guys come from miles away to come down and encourage him for a week and they just plain lift his spirits and encourage him. And after that encouragement, he makes his way up and parks himself someplace near the Tiber River where we went to San Paolo Ara Regola, near the Tiber River, and puts himself there waiting for Nero. So when Paul gets here, he's been now a couple of years waiting, and he's not able to go anywhere he wants. He's on a light chain, not an actual chain, it's an idea. And during that time, at any point, he could be whisked in front of Nero. It could be the middle of the night. And with no preparation, he has to think through his own case. These trials are called maestas trials. They're trials for the good of the state and accusations against the state. The big problem, Christians don't appear to be religious. They appear to be atheists and won't give alms and sacrifices to the gods of the state that keep us all safe. And so what started off as a trial on one thing morphed into a trial on another the way it happens when Congress investigates something. Starts over here, ends up way over here, okay? And that's pretty much what happened. Goes in front of Nero, Nero cuts him loose, 
because the subduction of the Bay of Naples has caused a major tsunami, wiped out a third of their ships. Nero's got a lot of things on his mind, and one of them is not Paul. Paul is released, and he travels into places, and there's a lot of speculation whether he makes it to Spain, whether he makes it into the Dalmatian coast, where exactly is Paul for a while, but he's picked up and arrested because of the words we think of Alexander the coppersmith when he's in northwestern Turkey. Under arrest a second time, the big event of the Magnum Incendium, the burning of Rome, has occurred in 64, and as a result, when he's put under arrest, Nero's in no mood to bargain. After a time, Paul waits, and sometime in 67, if he goes before the governor and not Nero, it's 67. If he goes before Nero, it's got to be 68, because in 67, Nero's tied up at the Olympic Games in Greece. And he will meet Paul, and Paul will get his assigned day to show up for his beheading. And the last of Paul's writings will go out in 2 Timothy, and he will say, I'm ready to be offered and he understands that he's passing the baton. Church tradition is that he dies 29th of June, 67. There are some who question that and say it's gotta be after January 68 if Nero's involved since he wasn't there. Again, you don't know in early church records whether or not when it says Nero killed him, whether it was at the behest of Nero or Nero was actually in the room and said, you're dead, okay? We don't know, but that's Paul's picture, and I'm hoping that picture, I've said it enough times now that you're starting to grab who Paul is. You can use that introduction and those words in front of any of the 13 named epistles of Paul, and hopefully that'll help you. Now, who is the mission pastor Titus? This is something I want you to understand. When Paul writes to Timothy or Paul writes to Titus, he's not writing to the pastor of the church. Yes, they are pastoring churches, but Paul is like the mission society. He's the pioneer missionary that's now established a work, but he's got it in the hands of someone else. Titus is like the missionary that goes to the place and appoints a series of pastors in those places. The reason I mention that is sometimes we get to Timothy and it's talking about paying the pastor. And it sounds like, like Paul's writing to Timothy and they're both kind of commiserating about self-pay. They're not. Neither of them are the pastor. It's somebody else. This is the Mission Society founding missionary writing to the mission pastor about the local pastors or local bishops that are involved in the different ministries. And he's saying, even though they have daytime jobs, yet it's okay for them to also take money to do this. So it's not, Timothy's not getting, Titus is not getting any, anything out of it. It's for someone else. And sometimes we don't point that out, it seems weird. Titus is a missionary planter. What we know about him, according to Titus 1.4, is that he came to Christ as a result of the ministry of Paul. What we know is that he came with Paul to the Jerusalem Council and that he was the Gentile-born youngin that did not have to be circumcised. Whereas Paul circumcised Timothy, he did not circumcise Titus, thereby underscoring there's a difference between the way Jews who know Jesus and Gentiles who know Jesus are commanded to live. How do I know? Because in the first century, Paul's test case was, here's one that should have been because God said circumcise for all your generations. Here's one that shouldn't be because he's not part of that. Both are saved. And the circumcision did nothing to add or subtract from their, their uh, ability to walk with Christ because one had it, one didn't, and Paul did that deliberately. I am forced to conclude that Paul saw a difference in lifestyle, but not a difference in salvation. Okay, now, at this point, what I want to stop and just think about is that Paul and Titus actually make their way together in some part of the journey. We know that that Titus was dispatched to Corinth to carry the Corinthian letter to the Corinthians. When you got a church that's in tough shape, when people are not walking with God and it's obvious and they think they're right by doing wrong, you send Titus. And Titus is gonna follow after Paul 
and he's going to do some of the tougher jobs. By the way, he's replaced, uh, Titus then goes to Crete and is replaced by Tychicus after him and the Cretan church grows. So the little letter we have is, Titus, you've only got a matter of months. Get this done. I got to get you out of there. Oh, when you're done, come visit me in Nicopolis. That's where I'll be. And so there, what we're going to look at is a little tiny three chapters of what happens to organize local believers. L let me just say that there are reasons why Paul wrote this letter. One of those reasons is that Paul loved the sensitivity and strength of Titus, and he wanted to show a church that needed help, somebody who was tough but tender. Uh, I sound like a Purdue chicken. The, the point is, he wanted something, he wanted the tenderness, but he wanted somebody who would stand by what they were supposed to stand by. We get this idea that the only way to show compassion is to acquiesce. And that's not the way to do it. So he says, there are a couple of things. Can I just say I'm running into more and more people who say, well, you know, the Bible doesn't really talk about establishing churches. It talks about making disciples. That's absolutely true. And in the first century, they thought making disciples looked like starting churches. You know how I know? Because there's no distinction between those verbs. Mathetusate, the verb to make disciples, was 100% of the time understood in the first century generation of apostles as making churches. You know why? Because I can't make a disciple that's part of a body without a body to, for it to go to. So if Jesus had just wanted to give you information, he'd have sent you a video and stayed in heaven. The fact is he wanted to model it, live it, and sweat with the boys. You need a church to be a healthy disciple. I don't know who told people that that's not true, but there is no evidence in the New Testament that anybody ever was a healthy disciple of Jesus Christ who absented themselves from the body of believers. Now, if you're on an island and there's only two other people and they don't know Jesus, then you know what your job is, witness. But the bottom line is, if you got any choice about it, you should attach yourself to a body of believers and make sure it's a vibrant body. Now, I'll also tell you this. There was some pressure. And there's a key involved in this. Paul says to him in, in 3.2, speak evil of no man. I want you to deal with the lost in meekness. Apparently, some real pressure, back pressure, had come from the Cretans. Paul says some pretty uncomplimentary things about the Cretans. And, you know, like they're liars and slow bellies and, you know, the things that he doesn't normally say about people that he's, you know, trying to reach. But here's what I can tell you is there are people that will not understand. Our call is not to argue incessantly. Titus was to go in strength, but in peace. And when you say we come in peace, what you mean is I'm not going to give up what I believe, but I'm not going to argue you into the kingdom. So. We get down to the book, and I, this is a good book. There are only six things I have to tell you, and then you're done this book, okay? Paul outlined the key principles of moving of believers into a body, because until you have leadership and structure, you have a Bible study. A Bible study is where people get together over a donut, and they talk about the Bible. That's not a church. Why am I articulating that? Because there's this house church movement right now that doesn't distinguish between what a church is and what a church isn't. It has nothing to do with where you meet or whether you own where you meet. It has everything to do until there are elders and leaders and accountability, it's not a church. In other words, until somebody's in charge and everybody knows who that is, and until there's a function of the body where there's accountability, it's a Bible study. Bible studies aren't bad, but that's not the goal. Because the structure of the church was the way in which God intended to make disciples that make disciples that make disciples. Now, let me show that to you, because I'm, I'm saying it, but in order for you to believe it, you've got to see it in the text. <laughs> Paul begins instructing Titus, and he says these words, Paul, a bondservant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness, in the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago, but at that proper time manifested even his word in the proclamation with which I was entrusted according to the commandment of God our Savior. This sounds like dense language. You know why? Because it's dense language. I want you to zero in on the part of verse 3 that says, I got entrusted with a proclamation. 
We are neither the authors of the gospel, nor are we in any way endorsed to amend the message. It's not my message. I was entrusted with the message of God's word to pass faithfully to the generation that I live in, and it's not up to me. And if it becomes unpopular, I don't get to adjust it to make it popular. We are not Jesus' PR firm. Our job is to faithfully but sensitively, carefully but accurately hand out the truth that was literally entrusted to us. And I do believe that in many forms and in many places, there are going to be those who answer for having adjusted the message to make it more popular and not deliver what their fathers entrusted to them. So here's what he says. I'm writing to Titus, my true child. While we're talking about fathers and sons, you're my true child in common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. We make note again that you cannot have the peace of God until you have the grace of God. And that's why that order is always there. I need the unmerited favor of God before I have the peace of God operating in my life. And then I get to verse 5, and he tells him the first of the six things I want to tell you. He says, everything, everything, everything rises or falls on the quality of your leadership. If you get the wrong leaders, your church is only waiting for its moment to blow. It will blow. It is absolutely essential that you spend more energy picking the character of leaders because the character of leaders has everything to do with what the church will become. And what's interesting is as I travel from church to church, I really see this. If you have an argumentative pastor, you will build an argumentative church. If you have a negative pastor, you will build negative churches. And I, let, me, I, let me tell you, there's a lot of churches out there that it's, it's disguised negativism. If you really start listening, they're basically negative about their worldview. So you want to choose somebody who's comfortable in their own skin. A church called me not long ago and said, did I have anybody that I could suggest to them as pastor? And I said, I'm going to tell you beyond all the normal requirements that you know biblically exist, I'm going to tell you there's one requirement that I would like you to think about. Make sure that this is a person who is comfortable in their own skin. They know their call, they know their limitations, and they got nothing to prove but to follow Jesus Christ. Because when you get insecure people leading other people, it does damage. Now listen to the way Paul writes it out. I'm taking some time to take apart some words. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. You might note that it's not normal for us in our day to have someone come and appoint elders. Uh, whether you call them pastors, elders, deacons, to, to appoint your leaders. We generally do that from within our congregations. You have to remember, though, this is the starting point. There isn't anybody. The, the first team gets chosen by someone. The second team has a team already from which to pull. So this is the beginning. And it says, namely, if anyone is above reproach. Now, you know this list. And the word above repro uh, reproach is someone that you cannot make legal charges in a court of law against somebody that has, uh, has been properly scrutinized. Let me use one word, vetted. Don't put anybody in leadership that isn't vetted. Now, can I just put some feet on that? I want to know if he ever declared bankruptcy. I want to know what his past financial dealings have been. Nobody's coming on to staff and working with me and getting pushed out to be a pastor in one of our churches unless I have some reasonable understanding of what happened in their past. Now, their past doesn't force me to conclude that that's all they can be, but it's informative. And if they hide it, that's also informative. I also have this next one, husband of one wife. There was not one way to be married under Roman law. There were four. Now, most of you live in states where there are two. There's common law marriage. And after one, three, or seven years, depending upon what state you hail from, you are considered legally married, even though there was never a ceremony. 
The second kind is what we would call a conferitio. It's a kind of ceremony. I now pronounce you man and wife. Those are the only two you have, but you don't have two others. Another kind of marriage that was a legal form of marriage at the time of Paul was for wealthy men when they had, as a patron, had a, a, a clientes, a client who owed them money, he could pay that money by giving his daughter as a pleasurable service woman to that man. That man took that girl into the house even though he was married his wife knew about it, and he could use services from that woman any way he chose for a period of time, but she was under marriage law in Rome. That's considered a temporary, but a marriage. And the point is that there were a lot of people doing that of wealthy classes, and Paul's gonna make rules in 1 Corinthians 7 and say, I don't care if it's legal, you don't do it because that's not the design of marriage. Why is that important? Because it gives us now in the 21st century, it doesn't matter what the state says is a legal marriage, it matters what God says is a marriage. Okay, there, there's our defense. But there was also another kind of marriage. Remember that they operated in a, in a, 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 slave, a slave state, and as a result, they had a contubernium marriage. This is a marriage where if Joe's slave is paired with Agnes' slaves to make baby slaves in year one, and Joe's slave is paired with Mary's slave to make baby slaves in year two, and Joe's slave knows Jesus, who is he married to? This is a problem Paul has to address in 1 Corinthians that you and I don't have to address. We're going to go over this when we're on site, but let me just say it this way. When he said husband of one wife, what it literally says is a one woman man. It's a one woman man. And a man of one woman means it's more than whether or not he's married in the past. This got nothing to do with divorce as best I can tell. This, if he wanted to say not divorced, he could have said not divorced. There's an easy way to say that in Greek. That's not what this is. This is a man who's characteristically faithful to one woman and one woman only. I don't think that has anything to do with divorce in his past, and I certainly don't think it has anything to do with divorce before he was saved. It, it doesn't make sense to me that Jesus saved you from all of your sins and you could have been a murderer and we'll make you an evangelist, but if you were, if you were divorced before you were saved, we can't make you anything because you're sidelined for life. However, if you haven't taken care of your children and raised and paid your payments. Now that's a handle. That I want to know about. I want to know, here's the thing, young, young guy comes, he gets divorced, he comes to Christ. As a result of the heartbreak of his own divorce, he comes to Christ. He comes to me and he says, I think God wants me to be a pastor. I'm not going to look at that young man and say, no, you can never be one. I'm going to look at him and say, you better take care of your former wife. You better make sure if you got children, you pay your child support, you pay it on time because you will not be a pastor with some kid out there who didn't get taken care of by his dad. That isn't going to happen. Now, I recognize we got all kinds of different standards on this. Let me just say that this one is a one woman man and I don't think it has anything to do with divorce at all. Now, when we're tomorrow, uh, when we're in Pompeii, I'm going to take you through the streets of Pompeii. We'll have a local guide show us a building then I'm going to stop and I'm going to say, all right, what does this illustrate in the epistles? Okay, we're going to swap off again for a minute. The far end has two other buildings. These are the tabularium and the comitium. These are public records departments. Now, the Romans are fastidious about keeping records because everything about inheritance laws falls on what's held in a tabularium. So stop and think for a minute. I told you yesterday in our time together that there was not one way of being married in the New Testament, there were four. So I could have a conferee show where I stood and I now pronounce you man and wife. I could do that. But I could also have a, a marriage called a tent marriage, like a slave marriage, contubernium, where I'm pairing slaves for the purpose of making baby slaves, right? Now, that's important because when Paul writes 1 Corinthians 7, he writes all about marriage, divorce, celibacy, remarriage. One thing I want to say to you is if you take a look at Deuteronomy 24, you'll find out that under the law, 
a woman who is divorced, it's assumed that she will be remarried. It's not unlawful to remarry. In fact, Deuteronomy 24, 2 says, and when she remarries. Remember that under the law, the law did not promote divorce, but it regulated divorce. And the section in Deuteronomy 24 is all about one thing. Just remember this in the law. Wherever God made a law, it was to protect the weaker party. That was the purpose. So what was a bill of divorcement? Ladies, you would get offered this bill of divorcement. I'm putting you away. Women didn't get divorces. Men divorced women in the New Testament period. But when they did, they got a bill of divorcement. The bill of divorcement was a, a protection to the woman. It says, I am divorcing you because you can't have children. I'm divorcing you because you burned my dinner. It depends on what rabbi you followed as to how strict you had to be. Hillel was a little liberal on the subject. But the point is, you would get a, a bill of divorcement. Ladies, you would keep that bill of divorcement. It was assumed you would be remarried. But when you're remarried, you would give the second man the bill of divorcement and he could not divorce you for the same reason predisclosed from your last marriage. Okay, so if you say, I can't have children with my last, you know, husband, they never figure out it could be him. They always blame her. I don't know why, but nevertheless, you know, blame Hippocrates. I don't know. The, the, the important thing is this. They don't know why things happen, but they predisclose it, thereby protecting the woman. Okay, in 1 Corinthians 7, I could have a, a, a slave pairing marriage, contubernium. I could have a coemptio and manum marriage. I could have a marriage where I literally have a pleasurable service woman underneath of the marriage I have to my wife, and it's for a temporary time, but that law was to protect that girl. I could not treat her as chattel. I had to treat her as a wife, even though she's not a permanent wife, okay? I may have any number of different kinds of marriages. Now, here's my point. One of the problems we open in 1 Corinthians 7 and you read books on divorce and remarriage, and one Christian will do a commentary on 1 Corinthians 7 and say, it's always wrong, divorce always wrong. The next one, he'll say, sometimes wrong, sometimes not, that, but you shouldn't get remarried. And we have all these opinions, but one text. Why, is God stuttering? Is it not clear in the text? No, here's the problem. There are four types of marriage in the New Testament and only two for most of you. We're trying to shove modern world views into a text that has more options than we do. And thereby what happens when we squeeze the passage is we don't all come up the same because we're not understanding what he's saying. In the text, Paul literally talks about the tent marriage. And here's what he says. If you're a slave and you can buy your way out, buy your way out. But if you can't buy your way out, listen, take no thought of this. What does that mean? It means if you're not responsible and able to choose, then you do not have to feel guilt. These are the verses we use for rape. It doesn't matter how you felt when it happened. It mattered that you weren't in control and therefore are not culpable. It's the person who has control that is culpable in the situation. So, in a simple office like the tabularium, we can illustrate marriage, divorce, remarriage records, but those records tell us about the different kinds of marriage and divorce. If you'd like to know more about that subject in 1 Corinthians 7, we can talk about that later, but what's important for you to know is there's a reason why Christians can't agree. The biggest reason is insensitivity to ancient culture when they're studying the Bible. They think the New Testament is written to them. It's not. Corinthians is written to Corinth, and you're not a first century Corinthian or a first century Roman under their laws. You're a modern, and you have different laws. So trying to shove your laws into their text is going to come up wrong, and that's why there's a lot of disagreement. Does that make sense? Yeah. Good, let's continue. Let me go on to the next one. It's interesting because it says, having children who believe. There are churches that teach if you didn't have children, you can't be a, you can't be a leader in a church. So, so you are forced to have children. I don't think that's the point. I think that he's trying to say that people within the context of his own leadership are loyal to the faith. 
I think if a man is struggling in his own household to manage those who are under his care and his direct responsibility, it's going to be very difficult for him to, to cloudlessly do that for the body of Christ. I would tell you that when I was raising my children, I was concerned about that. I was concerned that they follow Christ, partly because I'm their dad and I want, to have, I want them to, to have the joys of a, an eternity with Jesus, but, but partly because I was concerned that I was called to do something and I wanted my children to follow. Now, I do not believe that the adult children of someone should disqualify them for ministry. Because we're, come on, we're living in a time when our kids grow up, move out, and they do what they want. And I cannot be responsible for my 32-year-old daughter because I've got no way to do that. And life has other influences besides mom and dad. But at the same time, it says, not accused of dissipation or rebellion. Interestingly enough, we can't tell by the Greek if that's the man or the children. We can't tell. I think it's the children. I think what it means is he doesn't have a kid coming in drunk at 3 a.m. Uh, six nights a week and he's not doing anything about it. Let me just say that I think that God, there's a principle in God's word that says, when I can't control it, I'm not responsible for it. So, you're, Ken, we're not going to hold you responsible for whether or not it's sunny today. It's going to be, but we're not going to hold you responsible for that. Why? You can't do anything about it. So God doesn't put you in a situation where you have a culpability for something you have no power to control. Uh, this is um, also in 1 Corinthians 7, something we use in the case of rape. If you aren't in charge of the event, you're not responsible for the event. So here's what I, I would say. You are responsible for the children in your home. But move quickly past that and it says, for the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain, but hospitable, loving, what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled, holding fast the <coughs> faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able to exhort uh, both exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. I want you to look very closely at the words that we have on page 81. I sort of took them apart. Here's the thing. I'm supposed to be a steward in the middle of that page. I'm not self-willed. That is that I'm not self-indulgent. Self-willed is not what you think it is. I want it my way. It's the word self-indulgent. It's a person who lives inside of parameters. Now, my students laugh at me, but I have chocolate days. I, I do. I have chocolate days. During the school year, I allow myself two days a week, I can have chocolate. Now, no one told me that. There's no church rule that we have. This is a Randy rule for Randy. Here's what I discovered. If you can always have everything, nothing is special. Do you know that I love chocolate more when I don't have it and can't have it because I'm not on a chocolate day than if I could have chocolate anytime I want? Now, the last two years, most chocolate days, I didn't have chocolate because I'd forget. Because the other days, I was saying, this is not a chocolate day. You can't have it today. Mm -hmm. But I can spend three days thinking of the beauty of a Snickers bar. <laughs> Me too. And then... And then my day comes and I can have that Snickers bar. The, the point is, self-will is self-indulgent. Whereas self-control in the Bible is self-limitation. It's when you say to yourself, others can, I can't, because I know what that's going to do. Because I already know me, once past the lips, twice on the hips, that's the way it works with me. And the bottom line is I'm going to have to, if I'm going to maintain any kind of, you know, lovely girlish figure, I'm going to have to work at this. Now, um, not quick tempered, is the word prone to anger or to harbor resentment. I want you to focus on that for a minute. The, the guys I want you to choose, Titus, cannot hold on to hurt. It's not just quick-tempered as in fire back. That word, orgulos, is actually prone to anger or prone to prejudice, bitterness, or resentment. You need someone in leadership who can take a hard shot and shake it off. 
Can I tell you, there's a class in seminary that if I was planning a seminary, I'd put into the seminary. It's called, how to shake off the last meeting when I walk into this one. I will come out of a meeting in which I am dealing with some very touchy, sometimes very angry, sometimes just downright nasty people, because they exist in the kingdom. Look, hurt people hurt people. And when they walk in and they're hurt, they're wanting to hurt me because they're wanting to put a world of hurt on everybody they touch because they're hurting and bleeding all over the place. And so here's what I do. I'll go through that meeting. And then the next meeting, I have two young people that are getting ready for their marriage, you know. And they're just as excited and happy as all. Here's what I don't want to do. Bring that terrible pain from the last meeting in the door of this one. Here's how people do it. Well, you think you're in love right now, but you just wait. <laughs> now, what kind of encouragement to young marrieds is that? It's the kind they hear in church. Yeah, he's nice to you now, honey, but you don't know anything about this. Like, I've had misery. I can't wait till you do. You know, what is that? And she's not here, so I'll tell you. Apart from Jesus Christ, Dottie was the best decision I ever made in my life. The, the woman filled my car with balloons. I mean, fill them with balloons on my birthday. And after that, I didn't know she liked me. I'm serious. People came to me and said, is this serious? I said, serious about what? I had committed to being single just before I met her. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, you know, she's my friend. And I just thought she filled my balloons because, you know, it was cute and a nice thing to do. Filled balloons all over my car. I just thought it was a neat thing to do. I didn't realize she liked me. I thought she sat there till after midnight till I got off my job so we could go out for half an hour because she was bored with life and maybe just wanted to do something. I had no idea she liked me. How was I supposed to know? <laughs> and if you don't know this, I'll tell you this. You, have, you are meeting one of the most unbelievably oblivious people on the face of the earth. So I have counted on my wife to know <laughs> what I need and to tell me before I knew it. <laughs> Honey, we talk about this now, but you haven't slept, you're grumpy, go to bed. We'll talk about it tomorrow. Really? Yeah, I really was up all night writing, wasn't I? I should go to bed. That's good, we'll talk about that tomorrow. I need her to be there before I get there, because if we both wait on me, we're in trouble. <laughs> now, having said that, if, you, if this guy holds on to things, if he doesn't understand, he's gonna be tempted to the next spot. Not addicted to wine is literally the word given over to or quarrelsome over wine. In other words, people are anesthetizing themselves simply because they won't deal with their pain. And the guy who walks through the door on, on a Sunday morning comes up and says, oh, pastor, I'm so sorry. I need help. I was drunk last night. If I, if I stop right then and don't address why, all I'm doing is kicking the ball down the road because he's going to come back next week and we're going to do this again. The question isn't, do you have a mechanism whereby to shut off your drinking? The mechanism, or before we get all snotty, or pills or whatever else you're doing. The, the real issue is why did you think this was going to help you when it didn't the last 42 times you did it? So, can I tell you how many people, there have been a number of pastors, pastors, ministry personnel, that I would call pugnacious. I mean, I wanna get them a pug t-shirt. They are pugnacious. These are people who are bruisers and they're ready to bruise people. There are people out there that they're carrying pain and they are quarrelsome and they are not at peace. Look at the one that says not fond of sordid gain. It's, it's literally eager for quick cash, greedy for quick cash. There's a lot of people out there that rather than work a job are more than ready to get the quick cash. Now, we can get weird about this. I, I don't, somebody asked me, if somebody wins the lottery, would you let them give money to the church? I said, well, I pray about it. Yes. <laughs> 
here's the thing. I've never, I've never played a lot. I wouldn't know what to scratch. I'd probably ruin the thing. I don't have any idea how to do it. But I, I'm not going to run around legislating for you what the Spirit of God is going to tell you in your heart. I, I don't need to make a lot of lists. I just give you the Spirit and He'll do all the listing for you. And, and honestly, there are people, we used to, are you going to think less of me if I tell you we used to play poker for M&Ms? Man, I could bet the house. Peanut M&Ms. Man, I could bet the house right there. And by the end, we all ate the M&Ms. Like, honestly, it wasn't the principle behind it. I wasn't going to fall into a life of crime and sin. I might, you know, eat too many M&Ms, but that's going to be the extent of it. I'm not trying to get on in your face. I'm just trying to say that there are a lot of people whose mentality is, how do I get something for nothing? And that entitlement is what kills the work of the Spirit. Let's, let's go past it. Not only is it about what they're against. Guys, I love this. They're hospitable, generous to strangers. They love what is good. They got a good head on their shoulders and moderated. They're, they're right about their thinking. They're devout or, or they, they see the benefit of following a higher law. And as a result, they curb their own impulses and hold on to the word. What I love about this list is it's not all bad, 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 bad. It's they're busy doing this and not doing this. They're busy doing this and not doing this. Do you notice? Just get a feel for it. The latter part of the list seems like they're just well-rounded people. They're, they're nice people. They're enjoyable people. They're people with a good head on their shoulder. The first part of the list was like extremity and self-indulgence. So if you're going to pick out anything about this list, just do it this way. Everything rises and falls on whether or not we get leaders that, first of all, have a real sense of their walk with God and they're, they're balanced about the way they approach life and they're sensible people. Senseless people running big ships like this are going to make a mess. You need people who understand how, how to do what they're called to do. Notice at the end, holding fast the faithful word, able to exhort and able to refute. If you cannot defend your faith, you cannot lead. And if you cannot encourage people deeply with the word, you're not going to lead them. Because ultimately, it's, they don't need a pep talk from you. They didn't go to Tony Robbins and get that. They don't need that from you. They need the word of God from you. And at the end of the day, it's not whether or not I can teach them verses. It's whether or not I can teach them to grab those verses and pour them into their life. It's what they're able to do without me that measures whether or not what I did with them was good. I get one year with students and I, I burn myself to the ground to make sure that they understand how the word works. How do you get the spirit of God and the word of God to work in you? Okay. So when I, you agree with me that everything rises and falls on leadership, I take it. Now, leaders have to remember that the church is a teaching organization and there's got to be some parameters on what we teach. So as a result, we're going to have to, in order to have a healthy flock, we're going to have to protect, make barriers and tell some people they don't get to say what they want to say. Well, that doesn't sound very loving. Sounds awfully judgy. But here's the truth. If everybody gets to say everything they want to say, there's no protection on those who cannot understand what they just heard. I've been preaching for a long time, and I can tell you that whenever we say something, the wrong people hear it. So if I say something about abortion, the, the lady who had one 20 years ago starts sobbing. The one who's going to have it next week doesn't think about what I said. The wrong people hear. So now I know when I'm preaching. I want to stop right here, and I want to tell you who I'm telling this to. If you're sitting here contemplating running out on your spouse with your secretary, I'm speaking to you. If you did this 30 years ago and messed up your life, and if you've repented before God, and you've gotten up with Jesus, and you're, you got that right, I'm not speaking to you. Because the wrong guy's coming to the altar while the guy who's harboring sin in his heart isn't listening. Here's what I can see. Verse 10, there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. Stop right there. Those are three different things. Rebellious men are a different group. Sometimes they overlap than empty talkers who are a different group, sometimes they overlap, than deceivers. 
There are some people that they don't mean to deceive and they're not trying to be rebellious. They're just talking because they like the sound of their own voice. Those are empty talkers. Those are or another version of empty talker is a person who pushes to talk about something that doesn't matter at all. Brother, I saw the video and I'm telling you that Jesus was actually crucified at the garden tomb. And anybody that doesn't believe that. And I look at them and I think to myself, why would you care? The fact that Jesus died for my sin is enough. If I got the right hill, the wrong hill, that's not really where my heart is. My heart is that Jesus died for my sin. The archaeological evidence may not favor what you're saying, but when you watch that video, he didn't tell you the counterpoints, he just told you his points. I get it. But all I'm saying to you is we can get all caught up in something that honestly, if you net it away, doesn't really mean anything. And one of the problems we have is we take everything we believe and we put it on an equal plane. And it's not all equal. I really may believe that the yellow packet sweetener is better for me than the pink packet sweetener. And maybe I'm right and maybe I'm wrong because nothing in my archaeology and rabbinic training entitles me to know whether the yellow packet's better for me than the pink packet. But I believe it, brother. Now, here's what I don't want to do is put that right up there with, the, with justification by faith in Christ alone. And we got a lot of guys who color of carpet equals work of the Holy Spirit. And there are different levels to these things. Now, I, I find that there's an awful lot of people who, uh, who are really caught up in this, but there are in the church, in the church, there are people who are deceivers. They find new insights that aren't there. They are busy looking at the edges, never looking at the center. And I, 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 they have to be dealt with. Look at verse 11. Who must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. One of the things Paul says is, if they're on the take, watch that. If they got paid for doing it, watch that. When I first went to the Bible Institute, we got, this, um, we got this building and the people were hoarders in the building. And I wanted to use the building for um, what we use it for now as the dormitories. In 1927 building and a hurricane came and ripped the roof off. And all the stuff that this person had been hoarding was soaking wet. Now, there were 20 rooms the size of this room and you couldn't see the windows you couldn't see, you walked in a little tunnel through it. What I was interested in in the beginning was the building and at the end it was the man and his wife. As I was emptying it, I was watching God deal with their hearts. They kept trying to give me money and I kept saying to them, you don't owe me anything. I'm gonna clean this out because you need me to help you do this. We cleaned out, we got the largest dumpsters, six of the largest dumpsters our company could get and they put them out front, we filled it and filled it. It took us six months to clean out that building. And I wanna tell you, when you peel up carpet and you put it over your shoulder and slime is running down your back as you're going down the stairs in 100 degrees, it's a very pleasant ministry experience. And I just say to the young people who are with me, isn't ministry everything you thought it would be and more? And we just make fun out of it. Here's the thing, I watched their lives change as we took away their stuff. And I realized that he had been a pedophile for years and he had just been sued by his daughter and his daughter took the building. We were getting it from her. And I realized that this man was bleeding a thousand different ways and she couldn't get him in a criminal suit. She got him in a, cause she didn't have the threshold of evidence but she could get him in civil court. And here were his children taking all of his property away. He had become a hoarder to hide. And what I found is that as all of this went away and it started to lift off of him, he needed somebody to understand him. And he kept turning to me, trying to give me stuff. If I would have taken a dollar from that man, I'd have lost my testimony. Not because I wasn't entitled to it, but because that would have changed the relationship. I go in and out of shops. Uh, you know, typically guides, drivers get uh, all kinds of cuts for things when you shop. I take nothing from anybody. 
And the reason I do that is it drives them crazy. I love it because it opens the door to testimony. I can stand there and say, all you owe me is I'll take a bottle of water and your friendship. How's that? Yeah, but you know, what? Because they can't understand why I'd keep doing it if I'm not on the take. As soon as people see that you have an ulterior motive, they forget your Jesus motive. And in verse 13, it ends by saying, for this reason, reprove them severely so that they may be sound in the faith. There was a defined scope of the men he said deal with. He goes on and talks about some of them are paying attention to Jewish myths, commandments of men who turn people away from the truth. Here's the thing. There are times when people will come in and they're asking a question because they heard something or they read a book and they don't know if it's true. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about people who decided already what they wanted to come in and teach. It has nothing to do with the Bible. It's got something way over here, some oddity, and they heard it. And so they're going to come in and they're going to turn the whole church to join them. Often people come into the church and it's like they don't want to join the church. They want the church to join them in whatever they do. So if you all would just change what I am, and they have to be taught lovingly, but they have to be instructed. Now, Quickly, go to chapter 2, because in chapter 2, Paul instructs Titus to do something else. He says, I need you to do more than just protect them. I need you to motivate the troops. And in the first 10 verses, here's what I want you to do. Motivation is more than just go team go. It's equipping you. You are fully motivated when you believe you can get up and do it because of what you learned. You did not get equipped if you stand there and go, I don't, I don't know what to do next. I work in a, in a ministry environment where we are absolutely focused on equipping. Every leader is told this when they take the job. You ought to already be looking for your replacement. From, the, from day one, you ought to be, I don't, we have, we have young people that are in their 30s, some that are in their 20s, some that are in their teens, and now even one of them that's just getting into high school that already my worship guy said that, that, that young man is going to be something. I'm going to get behind him because four years from now, he's going to graduate high school and I want him to be in a worship team. I think he's got the heart for it and the desire for it, so I'm going to come alongside of him. If you give them the opportunity to do it and then equip them and work with them, you know what happens? People come in, they go, I don't like this pastor, but they never actually sit down with anybody and try to pour into the guy to get him to be where he needs to be. True or false, there are some pastors that need preaching seminars to learn to preach. Because they could take the exciting, life-giving truth of the Word of God and bore you to death with it. <laughs> Jesus might have been raised, but you're totally dead by the end of that message. <laughs> so the point is equipping. He says, as for you, speak the things which are fitting sound doctrine. Stop right there and mark it in your mind. What is sound doctrine according to Paul? In for lapsarianism, rapture theory, Calvinism. No, listen, sound doctrine is relationship. Older men teach them this. Older women teach them this. Younger men teach them this. Younger women teach them this. Sound doctrine equals livable faith. And if you don't teach people how to live Jesus, you did not equip them with sound doctrine. Don't tell me that they can quote all kinds of great, wonderful things. I can stand here, and I'm serious, I could stand here right now and quote systematic theology textbooks, and that doesn't mean I even know how to be a Christian. That just means I know how to memorize. Now, let's cut them apart really quickly. What are the older men to do? How did Paul measure this church? Older men are to be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, filled with charity, with patience. All right, now let's take it apart. Sober is the word not wine controlled. It's also used for clear headed. Grave is the word worthy of respect. That's a person who has a seriousness and a dignified temperament. This is not supposed to be Jerry Lewis keeping the board, board meetings light, okay? You, you need to be able to laugh, but the guy needs to know when it's serious. The, the temperate is his self-mastered. And, and I, I get concerned. I really do. Because Christians pick the things that they should have mastery over and ignore the others. There are whole areas of life we just ignore. Because we're not going to tell you you can't, can't be obsessive. Listen, 
I think it's wonderful to have a hobby. I think to do something is great, but when it starts doing you seven days a week, you might be out of balance. About how many days a week can you whack a little ball out on a, on a hillside? And I, this is a Floridian talking. There is no end. If I said that in a Florida meeting, they go, seven? That's the limit. Because they don't really understand that after hours of perfecting a game that dies when they do, they didn't accomplish anything. But if they take a guy with them and spend some time, or take a young person and teach them to do it while spending time with them, they just took a passion and turned it into a ministry. It's not about what you can do. At the end of the day, your, your game is going to be lost with you. But that young person will go on. OK, he's supposed to be in love and endurance. You know, that's a military term. Brave persistence. We got a lot of guys who just, they can, they can get on, come off the blocks fast, but they can't stay. How about the women? Let's go, go quickly to the women. Older women, what are they to be? It gives me this list. In behavior as becomes holiness, that is reverent in the way they live, not slanderers, not addicted to much wine. And here's the thing. The grammar suggests that, that the second and the third one are linked together. That is, false accusers was linked to their wine drinking. Okay, that's the grammar. Grammatically, it looks like they babble a lot because they drink a lot. Teachers of good things. I love this. Teach teaching younger women. What I love is that the last part of it turns out to be a very positive thing. How about younger women? They're supposed to learn from the older women to be devoted to their husbands, devoted to their children, self-controlled, pure. And then there's this wonderful oikoros, the word for home guard. This is the one, the, the younger woman needs to learn to be that lioness at the door that says, don't you bring that in here. And that includes what comes in on the airwaves. No, 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 this is not language we have in our house. That's, that's part of her job. She should see herself as a protector for the things that go on in the home, but also be kind. Now, here's the thing. The word obedient to their husbands in the NIV is actually to be subject to their husbands, which is actually the word to willingly place themselves beneath. This is a function of a believer. I am to willingly place my needs beneath those around me. A, a, a wife is to willingly place herself beneath. There's no man that can make you do this. This is something you have to choose and it's a hard attitude and it's got nothing to do with who gets to make the decision on what color the kitchen's gonna be. There's no man that I know that's gonna make that decision that I wouldn't call an idiot. Okay? You, you break it this way. Garage, mine, kitchen, yours. It's easy, okay? I got this from my dad. And the bottom line is, now let, let's get down to young men. Young men, he is to exhort or come beside them and show them to be self-controlled. You know what young men do? I'll take a break in the middle of class. A couple of 20-year-olds walk down the hall. They don't walk down the hall. Normal people walk down the hall. They walk three steps. He turns, he shoots, he scores, yeah! And then they keep walking. There are bursts of energy involved in what God put in you to grow your body. They don't know what to do with them and usually they leave holes behind when they're done. So we have to teach them by coming alongside of them that those bursts of energy should not all be acted upon like all other impulses. You might want to, that's got nothing to do with what you do. And then he turns to Titus, the church planter. And he says, look, as you're out there, I want you to hold yourself beside them as an example. Uncorrupt doctrine, grave speech, integrity in your words, dignity, seriousness, soundness. And then turn around to those who are slaves and help them to understand that they are to attempt to please their masters. They're to attempt to not talk back, not steal, but demonstrate to them that they have a walk of, with God inside. All right. While you're doing that in verses 11 to 15, I want you to keep working, keep working. The grace of God has appeared to bring salvation, instructs us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. Would you look at verse 12 for a minute? 
It is part of the purpose of God in your salvation that you would deliberately deny things you want to do. I don't know who told Christians that we're not supposed to deny ourselves, but this says that you're supposed to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and live sensibly, live righteously, godly in the present age. Christianity is not just about heaven. It's also about today. It's also about choices. It's also about my walk. Now you get down to chapter 3, you're in your last chapter, and the church has to be characterized by a gracious spirit, but there has to be modeling going on. In relationship to the authorities in the world, I'm supposed to model subjection. That means bad-mouthing presidents and bad-mouthing Supreme Court is a bad idea for a believer. You can disagree with an idea, but when you show hate toward a person, you're just showing yourself to be immature. Disagree with all the ideas you want, but make them about the ideas and not about the person. In fact, I'm to be subject, obedient, and ready. Look at verse 2. To malign no one, but be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. In relationship to the community, I'm supposed to be a considerate and understanding person. I love the word peaceable. Ah, makos, not macho. That's the word, not macho. Abstain from fighting and being contentious. Because there's a lot of guys going, I'll tell you what you want, I'll tell you. That's just, you're just being macho. But, but what I should be doing is showing consideration. Get down to verse 8, because this is the last of the six things. And the last one is, I need to be careful about something. I need to take care of something. Listen to these words at the end, toward the end or middle of the, of the chapter. This is a trustworthy statement, verse 8. Concerning those things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. Would you stop right there at verse 8 and just remember that just because a person is saved doesn't mean they're going to engage in good deeds. They've got to be taught that. Plenty of people think, I got Jesus, I got my fire insurance, now I'm going to live my life. <coughs> And they don't realize that engaging in good deeds is actually part of the thing. These things are good and profitable. Now, Titus, Titus, I need you to avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law. They're unprofitable and they're worthless. He says, people are going to try to get you tied up in knots over things that do not produce godliness. Let me try something for a minute. Um, we're almost done. If a, if a young man comes to your house and wants to marry your daughter, and they are, in some ways, they know Jesus Christ as their Savior, they are growing in their faith, they have the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness. They have the fruit. But they have a theological background that's different than yours. There's some theology background, some thing, end times prophecy thing that's different than your prophetic scheme. Are you more concerned about that person marrying your daughter because of their end times eschatology? Or would you be more concerned if you didn't see the fruit of the Spirit? Which would bother you more? Okay, so we all agree that you can have a variety of eschatologies, but if you have fruit, I'm okay with you marrying my daughter. You, what you just said is this is here and this is here. The fruit of the Spirit and demonstration of the life of the Spirit within you is different than whether or not I agree with your boneheaded doctrine on eschatology because you don't agree with the right thing, which is the one I agree with. So we've got to start to think of it in this way. What are we trying to produce in our young people? The, the sharpness of eschatology or the wonder of the fruit? If the wonder of the fruit is more important, then why are we spending more energy on this than we are on that? Why do we allow sensuous, rebellious young people to learn all the finer points of eschatology without expecting them to surrender sensuality and understand uh, subjection? We've got to focus on the thing that really matters in the end. And here he says, avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, and strifes. Reject a factious man after a first and second warning. In other words, do people get endless time to dominate the agenda by their own immaturity? Answer, no. See, there are people who believe strongly, because God told them something in their life, that they, 
I, you can't listen to that kind of music. If it has that beat, you can't listen to it. This is the church I grew up in, okay? Now, what they want to do is take what God told them and make it our rule. Well, the problem with that is you're going to end up in the lowest common denominator church. Anybody with a disagreement runs the table. See, so all I have to be is immature to be in charge. I had a guy come to me and he said, those tires on the back of your car are offensive because they're wide and that's rebellious, son. I was 20 years old. I was in Bible college and that's the tires that came with the car. Now, the car was a Chevy Bel Air station wagon <laughs> with a 216 engine that could go zero to 60 in about 22 minutes if you were on a downhill stretch in North Carolina, okay? So my point is, this guy came in and he said, you need to get rid of those tires. So here's what I told him. I said, brother, thank you for pointing that out to me. I, I didn't know they were offensive to you. If you buy the tires, I'll put them on. Because I'm a Bible college student and I'm flat broke. He never bothered me about those tires again. Mm -hmm. yes. But another guy came up to me and said, your hair is parted on the side. And that is a symbol of rebellion. Another guy didn't like my beard. Another guy didn't. <coughs> Here's the thing. You can spend your life running around running other people's lives. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, they didn't know me, didn't care about me. And if it was going to cost them a dime, all of a sudden they got out. By the way, I changed my hairstyle and I cut my beard. Why? Because I thought, I'm not losing these people over that. Yeah, if I'm going to lose you, it's going to be over something substantive. In the end, let me just close this off and say, reject the factious man, knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. Something's wrong with a person. I've said it to you before, and I mean it with all my heart. You get some Limburger cheese stuck on your upper lip and the whole world stinks. It's not them, it's you. There are people running around and everything they smell stinks, but it is not the other people. So, oddly, Paul says, you know, hey, even disputes about the law. Look, at the end of the day, here's our problem. I don't need to win the argument. I need to please the Savior. And if I don't do that, I've missed it all. And that was his message to Titus. Okay? Questions? You all right? It's afternoon, so let me pray and let you go because I can tell you're just going to want to do that. Father, we are so incredibly thankful that you have made clear that we are to work as a body and not as an individual. That I need to walk with you and I need to, 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 to walk with an audience of one, Jesus. That I need to look to you for when you're happy. But at the same time, I function within the body. Would you help me, Father, to learn the importance of the other people in the room and place them high? Thank you, thank you, thank you for gifted, godly men and women in my life that spur me to good works and help me to remember that I'm to become more than I am. Thanks for the great models of men in ministry that have touched my heart. Thank you for a great mom and dad and the learning that they helped me do. Lord, you've been good to me. And I'm just saying thank you out loud in front of this company of people because we know you are good. We have experienced your goodness. And in just a few hours, we'll sit down at the table and experience it again. And we are thankful in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.